Okay, hi, this is Graham. Uh, this is the MIT device here, and I'm, uh, this is video number two, and maybe it'll be a series or something. This is kind of my notes as I develop this. Um, so I'm going to ramble a little bit, but this uh, will contain a record of, um, I guess, everything I see. Well, the camera's running, you will see too. I wanted to point this out because I did an experiment, and I want to record the results of how the device changed uh, with those uh, changes in place. Uh, and uh, what we've done here is take the output circuit here and I've uh, added two shunt capacitors. The output circuit consists of two output coils and they're wound a little bit like the old-fashioned RF chokes you used to see in like ham radio transmitters or maybe that you've heard of. Um, it comes in three sections, it's called a pie winding or at least this is something like a pie winding where we have eight turns and I ran four uh, runs of Litz wire. And they're all in parallel. So there's the first eight turns and you can see when it gets done with that eight turns it ducks in to the coil form to the next eight turns ducks in again to the next eight turns. And the coil form is a little bit interesting too uh, because it has a variable spacing. So for the first coil uh, it's uh, just a, the thin form right around the ferrite core about a sixteenth of an inch thick. Uh, then for the second core, or sorry, the second layer here uh, I added about another sixteenth of polycarbonate which is a good dielectric and then on the third one I added about an eighth of an inch of polycarbonate and the reason for that is on the uh, first winding here that's ground so if it's right next to that core which is resistive that's alright but this uh, next layer is eight turns from ground and when the pulse comes we're at about 15, 20, sometimes much more volts per turn and the key, the key here is rise time and that's what this video is about uh, so that's why it's spaced out with a good insulator because the first turn on the inside of that winding uh, is already eight turns high so it's eight turns times maybe 20 volts a turn so we place some dielectric in there not only a good dielectric but a little bit of distance to reduce the capacitance to the core and the third winding here the third section is 16 turns high so it's 16 times 20 volts a turn so it's got some appreciable voltage on it so I added even thicker insulation so there's even less capacitance to the core the pi windings are used when you want a very high self-resonant frequency. So when I look at the self-resonant frequency of each one of these windings, when it's taken off the core, just as a piece of wire, just a wire coil, uh, the self-resonant uh, frequency of this whole assembly here is on the order of 10 megahertz. So it's a very fast coil. It has a very fast rise time built into the way that it's made. Now the hot end of this coil goes to the drain, or really the anode, Let's see if I can cause the phone to focus well again. Of a silicon carbide MOSFET. You can see it goes to the center pin there. That's the drain terminal. So when the MOSFET's off, it's a small nonlinear capacitance, no conduction. And the source goes out to the capacitors. And normally with a MOSFET, the drain is positive and the source is negative. These ones run backwards. When the MOSFET is open, the drain whips positive. Uh, with this pulse, but when the MOSFET's on, uh, pulse isn't running, so we actually get a negative voltage out of the source into the negative terminal of the capacitor. So if you draw the schematic for this thing, uh, it looks a little bit backwards. It looks like these electrolytics have been uh, installed with the wrong polarity, but that's really the way it works. So when the current is flowing and the MOSFET is closed, you get a negative potential out of the source terminal, and it charges up the negative pole of the capacitor. When the MOSFET turns off, it makes this big voltage spike. And in the first video, we see, I don't really go into detail, I don't think, uh, but it's about one microsecond wide. Uh, here, that spike is a little wider, and if we move it over here, you can see we're at one microsecond division, per division. So in the, uh, you see right about here, the MOSFET turns off. There's a slight, I mean, a couple hundred nanoseconds of dwell time, and then this pulse begins. And right when the pulse is over, we set a timer to turn the MOSFET back on. So it becomes a almost perfect conductor again. These MOSFETs are good. They're rated for 1200 volts of withstand of voltage when they're off. And when they're on, they're a 25 milliohm resistor. Just to put that in perspective, the DC resistance of this coil is 134 milliohms. So uh, to look at it in proportionality, you'd uh, maybe find that the on state resistance of that MOSFET is good for equivalent to a couple of turns of wire here. So the coil has more resistance than the MOSFET does when it's on. For this experiment, uh, I added 
a capacitor on each one of the output coils, and they're identical, uh, right across it. So this terminal over here is the ground terminal, and here's the high voltage terminal that gets the pulse on it, but I put a thousand picofarad capacitor across it. These MOSFETs, when they're off, are a couple hundred picofarads, so this capacitor has a greater capacity than the MOSFETs do when they're off. So it slows down the pulse. And instead of a pulse width of about a microsecond, we have extended it to about two and a half microseconds. We've kind of doubled it, let's say. Well, it might not look like much, uh, but the way that it affects the energy transfer is kind of profound. I've adjusted the input voltage such that we get 10 watts on the output, but the input has gone up to 7 watts. So the COP is much lower. You can see here the COP is not even 2. It's like 1.3. The watt meters agree. We see there's uh, nearly 11 watts on the output, 10.8. Uh, the oscilloscope says 10.6, but before I took this video I didn't take all the DC offsets out of the scope. That has to be adjusted every so often, so it would be a little bit more precise if I had done that. Uh, but this is maybe not needing that precision right now, just to make the point. We see that the input, uh, as seen by this uh, watt meter right here, is on the order of 8 watts. The scope sees about 7.8 watts, uh, so that's pretty consistent. And if we zoom this out uh, to look at one cycle here, that alternate method of measurement on the scope using not an active differential probe like this scope uses, uh, but two passive probes with the scope doing uh, the differential per um, calculation in its own internal math after the sampling. Uh, is also consistent. It's about 8.2 watts in the time running average. So we're again within about a quarter watt of agreement on all the different instruments here. And that's just from slowing down uh, these pulses a little bit. From one microsecond to two and a half microseconds. It had definitely been my intuition while I was working with this thing that we want the fastest rise time possible. Now that one microsecond rise time is a half a sine wave, so when the capacitors are gone, I can't remove them right now, uh, but when that pulse is about a microsecond in duration, we can think of it as about a half a sine wave. Really, it's sort of a Gaussian curve, but if we think of it as half a sine wave, then we can draw the other half, if it were a sine wave, and get the equivalent frequency, which is on the order of 500 kilohertz. This bottom core is rated to about 200 kilohertz, uh, given its ferrite material. It's good to about 200 kilohertz before losses start to set in. So, although I think that a fast rise time and a sharp pulse is a good idea, um, it's also in the high loss regime of the core, at least by the data sheets. I haven't confirmed that with any experiments for this particular application, and maybe it's different, uh, but if you look at the data sheet for this particular core material, it's good through about 200, 250 kilohertz. So driving over the 500 kilohertz uh, equivalent period of pulse uh, might be counterproductive. Turns out it's not. If we look at... Uh two and a half microsecond uh, duration here. We double that to about five microseconds, which in my off the top of my head math would equal 200 kilohertz. So we'd be in the low loss regime for that core. And it looks like core losses are not what is determining the COP. Here we have a much lower COP and the waveforms are a little different. If you look at the last video, the way that this uh, current wave goes is much more abrupt with those capacitors removed. I'll try tuning out here the uh, yeah. now that high frequency glitch is gone on the secondary current uh, and that comes by fine tuning the time when the MOSFET turns back on. If it turns on a little bit early then there's still some voltage across it, it's shorting that out so we get ringing and if it turns on late then there's some current through its body diode there's a voltage drop across that and it shorts it out so there's a little bit of ringing and in this case, that short is across these external capacitors, and that sudden shorting is what creates that high frequency ringing. Anyway, this is to demonstrate that we want the minimal capacitance here, because the less capacitance, the greater the COP, or the greater the margin of amplification. So I can remove these capacitors again. I'll try to do that quickly, and then turn the machine on again in this same video so we can see the difference. Okay, so here we are again. The capacitors have been removed and set aside, so now there's nothing uh, 
no deliberately added capacitance. There's the self capacitance of the coil windings and the body capacitance of the MOSFET, but uh, and maybe a few dozen picofarads or something in this terminal strip. Uh, but really nothing that we couldn't avoid. Um, so these they were a thousand picofarads less than across the output coils. I took the original waveform that we were seeing last time. Let me grab my little pointer here. Um, and caused the oscilloscope to store that. So in white here was the waveform we were looking at last time so that we can see the live waveform and blue in contrast. Uh, we can see it's really more than a microsecond I would say and we'll move the trigger point just a little bit maybe to make a better comparison. There, that's more like it. So we're really about a microsecond and a half at least at this amplitude. You can see the the open time is the same. So here uh, what we've begin to see is we have that peak and the body diode engages it's trying to ring but it's shorted by the body diode and the MOSFET and then we want to go back up again because that body diode is uh, not reverse biased anymore 